This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 259, recorded on October 17th, 2013. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Today is October 17th, 2013, and we are back in Austin, Texas, We're on the campus of the University of Texas, where not too long ago we recorded a podcast, and Rich, it is the next day after that recording, and uh, Rich Condit are, and I are back Hi there, Rich. Hi there, Vincent. Here we are again. A day later, and the weather is totally different. Yes, it's it really is gorgeous nice. today. It is, uh, now, know? people will be hearing this weeks after the original podcast, but the weather today is just beautiful. Yesterday it was raining and cloudy and depressing. Today it's sunny. It's 13 degrees Celsius, 72% humidity. It went down since yesterday. It's about as nice as it gets. And it uh, looks like it's going to be sunny all day. And we are both leaving today, which is good because it looks like the forecast for the rest of the week through the weekend is clouds and 20 degrees Celsius. So <laughs> we need to get back. Uh, our guest today is a professor in <laughs> molecular BS. Molecular BS. <laughs> Jackie Dudley, welcome to TWIV. Thank you. Glad to be Do here. Do you like being in molecular BS? Um, I must say that I'm... I'm missing microbiology. Microbiology, what was the original title of the? So the department that I joined <coughs> there, right. uh, in 1983 was the Department of Microbiology. But you're creating the Institute of Infectious Disease, right? Which That's will right. The Centers for a, the CID, you, the Centers right. for Infectious Disease. Which will give the, the bug people a home. That's right. Will you be part of that institute also? Yes. So now this uh, Molecular Biosciences, MBS, is the umbrella name for all the, the science departments that were merged, including molecular microbiology, your original right, department, and a few Right, the molecular genetics and microbiology. And it has 70 faculty. Approximately. Which seems like the kind of department that no one would want to head, not, at least not me. It's crazy. Well, I wouldn't want to head any department. Yeah, me, but I, I agree with you totally. So let's talk a little bit about where you came from, Jackie. Um, where are you from originally? So I grew up in an unincorporated little town called Scott Depot, West Virginia. Wow. It's between yeah. Charleston and Huntington. It's about equidistant. Um, so I was really the daughter of an electrical engineer who worked for Union Carbide for 17 years. And then he was one of the first people to work in the plastics industry. And then he quit. Plastics. And yeah, plastics. That's, I'm looking at Rich Condit because you know, your dad wasn't at Union Carbide, but... He was at uh, Chevron Research. And he, he had the idea for plastics, but they poo-pooed it. Uh, well, actually what happened was <coughs> that there was a there was a little company, uh, you know, a startup, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That made this, was playing with this new polymer called polypropylene, all right? <laughs> and uh, Chevron actually bought the company and the license and all that stuff, and they were researching this stuff, and uh, my father was in charge of that operation. They had a big warehouse that he took me through that they were making all sorts of different things with polypropylene and trying to figure out what they could do with it and also trying to improve it and test it and that kind of stuff. And uh, one day, the directors just decided, this isn't going anywhere, <laughs> and shut it down. Foresight. All right? Look around, man. Everything is made of polypropylene. Of course. So my dad was essentially in there uh, designing the first equipment that would process plastics. Cool. And so then he quit and... By, by process, so, like forms and stuff, or...? No, uh, he started uh, his own company and started making centrifugal dryers. So most of the plastics are processed in a big water slurry. Um, so 
Then they went on to make all of the equipment, the pelletizers, the extruders, the underwater pelletizing systems. And so I was his gopher. I was his little boy that would go out in the garage and he taught himself how to weld. He built the first centrifugal dryers in our garage. And then he would drive them to Texas because his first customers were people that he used to work with at Union Carbide. Sounds like you knew something and remember a lot of it as well, right? Oh yes, because I was on the board of the directors of his company oh. for 12 years. <laughs> And it, that co the company still exists. I mean, we had to sell all of the stock, I guess, mm -hmm. when my dad died. How old were you when, when, when you started working with him in this capacity? Oh, I mean, I can remember when I was in grade school, when he was first setting up the company, he would work all week. We would drive to Virginia, and he, then he would work all weekend setting up his business. We'd drive back, and he'd go back to work on Monday. Wow. Do you think this had any influence on you becoming a scientist? I, I absolutely do. Yeah. I mean, he was, he had lots of patents. He always had ideas. He was always trying new things. So it was, he was a very inspirational guy. So you went to high school in this town in Virginia as well, is that right? It's West Virginia. West Virginia. Scott Depot, I got it right here on Google Maps. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a real little, it's, it's kind of a thriving little suburb now between Charleston and Huntington, West Virginia, the southwest part of the state. Where'd you go to college? So I went to WVU. There was really no West, question. West Virginia University. West okay. Virginia University. So lots of people there from Pennsylvania because it was actually cheaper to get out of state to WVU than to University of Pittsburgh or Penn. Where is West Virginia University? In Morgantown. <coughs> Morgantown. What did you major in? So my major was medical technology. Oh, that's interesting. Were you going to be a med tech? I was, and then, you know, when I started to take microbiology, I was just really thrilled. Mm. And I <laughs> went up to the professor and I said, is there any way that I could, you know, work with you and do some experiments? So I worked with him, and then as part of the medical technology program, you actually started your junior year, and then you went all the way through the summer because you worked in the hospital. So we went to school all summer. So we also did these little internships in clinical labs. So I also worked for a clinical virologist. Uh, so we went eight to five working in the clinical labs. And then, you know, in your free time, you volunteered in these clinical labs. So so we were interested in microbiology in general, or were you getting turned on to viruses? I was already? really getting turned on to viruses already. And so it turns out the guy that I worked for was actually doing, he, he wasn't really doing much research. And so I ended up screening for these heat labile bacterial toxins that were clinical isolates. And then I told him I was interested in studying viruses. So he knew someone at Baylor College of Medicine, someone named Delrose Dubs. And he said, they have one of the few departments of virology in the whole country. So why don't you apply there? And then I think that's, that's where I went. I think that's still the case. There aren't so a many. Department of virology. A department of virology. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I think it's now fused as microbiology, but it has virology in the title, which is yeah, somewhat unusual neat. too. So what year would that have been? So I went to graduate school in 73. So uh, so after, uh, sorry, so you went to, to Baylor for graduate school. When, right. I, when I think of, one, of, one of the reasons I ask about dates is that in my mind there's a timeline uh -huh. that among other things is uh, populated with sort of the state of the field and technologies and that kind of stuff. So 1973 is pre-cloning. Oh, yes. Right? Yeah. yeah sure. And of course it's pre-sequencing. There's RNA sequencing and protein sequencing. Uh, there's no uh, there's no cloning. Well, people are doing we're, RNA maps. We're just starting to get used to, I mean, even restriction enzymes weren't really... No. You mean like Not in of, general you use you because mean, the uh, first retrovirus was cloned when I was in Mike and Harold's lab. Okay. So by RNA maps, you mean oligonucleotide fingerprints, yeah. right? That's fingerprints. right. Yeah, those I did those as a grad student. Yeah. RNA's T1 mapping. T1 from, when was I a student? From 75 to... 79, I was a student, and then we did T1 maps, yes, yeah, so a little bit later, but same time. Mm -hmm. So wh who did you work with 
as a student at Baylor? So I worked for Janet Butel, mm -hmm. who, as you know, is mostly works on SV40, and she was really involved in, you know, identifying the gene for T antigen. Mm -hmm. And I was the first person in her lab to work on retroviruses, and she had a collaboration with some people in cell biology, uh, Dan Medina and um, Jeff Rosen. Mm -hmm. And so they were interested in mouse memory tumor virus and breast cancer. And so that's what I was interested in because my grandmother had breast cancer and I wanted to study viruses that cause breast cancer. Yeah. And of course, at that time, we're all about viral etiology for cancers. That was absolutely uh, you know, that was that's in some people's minds that was going to be the whole story. So right. Well, deal. I mean, you know, in the 70s, that was the whole Saul Spiegelman and, you know, looking for MMTV and human breast cancers. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's still you papers that come out about this, too. Did you read The Emperor of All Maladies? You must have. I have read part of it, yeah. So they, he says in the history of cancer, there were three camps that evolved. One who thought viruses did it all, another who thought chemicals in the environment, and a third who said it was in your genes, right? Uh -huh. And in the end, you know, they all yeah. came together. But As, as is so <laughs> often the <laughs> yeah. case, you know. It's great. Right. So that is where you became infatuated with MMTV, right. mouse, mouse memory tumor virus, which you worked on all these years till today, and you still work on it. I right? still do. And you didn't work on any other virus in your own laboratory? Or? Um, well, I can't say that because I've certainly, um, you know, worked on um, Abelson leukemia virus right. when I first went to Rex Rizzer's lab. So after I was in Harold and Mike's lab, then I went to uh, McArdle Laboratories at University of Wisconsin-Madison, mm -hmm. and he was interested in mouse genetics and also the etiology of uh, oncogene-induced cancers like, you know, V-ABLE. And I essentially did a control for some of the interesting phenotypic changes that were happening to these tumors in vivo and one of those controls was looking at endogenous viruses in uh, of which MMTV is one of the endogenous viruses in all the common inbred strains. And so it wasn't clear where the origin of this tumor was. And I said, well, we can just look at the endogenous viruses of MMTV in these tumors and tell what the origin is. And it turns out it didn't look like any of the known inbred strains. And all of these tumors that he was carrying had many, many copies of MMTV and so clearly had undergone an exogenous infection. Hmm. Right. Sure. So after Butel at Bailey did a postdoc with Mike Bishop and Harold Varmus at That's U right. UCSF, right? That's right. And did you continue to work on MMTV? I did, you know, because at the time we were trying to figure out what were the gene products. It was not really known mm -hmm. whether MMTV made the same gene products as so, like the avian leukosis and leukemia uh, sarcoma viruses were making. So at that time when you went, was SARC already identified? Um, it was, it was, yes, it had already been identified uh, really by the Dominic Stalin experiments where that they were showing that there was an oncogene that was in ASV. So, so for the yes, listeners who may not say know, <laughs> Varmus and Bishop. Uh, <coughs> they had the, done the Nobel Prize winning yeah, work they, before they I the, got there. They yes. are the, 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 the big boys in retrovirology. They did Absolutely. all of the fundamental stuff. Well, okay. and they're, you know, in the Bay Area too, there were you know, um, you know, Peter Duesberg was there, and then they would also meet with Peter Vogt. So there was this meeting that was kind of a West Coast meeting. And what was the evolution of the Varmus Bishop thing? Okay, were they both professors or? Um, at UCSF they were, but my understanding was that Harold started out as Mike's postdoc when they okay. were at NIH, and okay. then they both. I think started out originally with Ira Paston. And so they were part of this very elite group of MDs that were being trained to be physician scientists. Okay. So that was an extraordinarily successful program because if you look at the people that came out of that program, 
almost all of them made big contributions to science. And so when were you at UCSF? <clears throat> so I went there in 78 and left in 80. Okay. So I was a pretty short postdoc, and, and also Harold was on sabbatical for about the first year of that. <laughs> he was in England. Okay. So then you went to, to Wisconsin for a while. Right. Is that a, another postdoc or a fellow? That was another postdoc, right. Continuing to work on MMTV? No, um, I went to work on Abelson virus. Abelson, that's right. You'd said that before. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then from... Um, that was with whom? With Rex Risser. Rex Risser. Okay. Right. Who also trained with Jim Watson. Okay. It's a web, right? It's a, yes. Yeah. It's you, a very... Someone was telling me yesterday about a website where you can trace... Oh, your no, scientific lineage. Someone said there's a wiki app. There's a wiki software available that you could install on a website and everyone can put their um, training in it and it mi ma mixes everything up and gives you trees of interrelated. That would be cool, wouldn't that it? Would I have to cool. look into that. Have well, to what, aren't we all supposed to be related in, you know, seven steps? Yeah, we're all related we're to Kevin Bacon. <laughs> 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 well, yeah. scientifically, we're all... Really but scientifically, close. I yeah, bet there's yeah. only about two or three steps. So. Yeah. Um, so uh, then from Wisconsin, you came to Texas, is that That's right? That's right. And you have been here ever since. <laughs> and I have been here ever and since. So I've looked several times when, at other jobs. But when was that that you came here? Um, so I started here in January of 83. 83, so 30 years. That's right. Wow. And you have worked on MMTV ever since, and that's what I'd like to talk about okay. for the rest of the time here. Uh, and maybe a few other things as well. So we had a few episodes on MMTV. Right? Yeah, but it would be you good love to start your MMTV. from scratch. We, we yeah. won our MMTV. That was, <laughs> that was Kathy Spindler's title. So let's start from the beginning. Give us an overview of the biology of MMTV. What is it? Where, okay. where did it come from? Yeah, um, where, how was it discovered? Where did it come from? Right, so... Um, it turns out that this really came from the original um, derivation of inbred strains of mice. And so there were a number of mouse fanciers, I guess, that just kept mice because of their coat color. And then Jackson Labs and then C.C. Little at Harvard, you know, realized that you could really um, fix certain genetic traits by inbred, in, inbreeding mice, and so not all species will survive inbreeding, but mice actually are very amenable to this. So um, they made these inbred strains of mice at Jackson Labs. They found some were high mammary cancer incidence, some were low mammary cancer incidence, and then when they intercrossed them, they found that if the mammary cancer incidence of the mother was high and she was mated to a male with low mammary cancer incidence, then all the female progeny developed breast cancer. And then the reverse was true. So it followed the tumor incidence of the mother. So and what, what, roughly when was the inbreeding of, of <coughs> mice? So this would have been the early 1900s. So, so inbred mice weren't always around. They weren't <laughs> always around, no. Mice have been around a long yeah, time. Right. But. So uh, you, you said something else that's very interesting. Not all species <laughs> can survive inbreeding. So people have tried with other species. Yeah, so chickens, I guess, don't do very wow. well with inbreeding. And monkeys, primates, non-human primates? I don't primates. know that anybody's tried that. Yeah. There were a number of royal families that tried it. In oh, that's it right. It doesn't work, <laughs> doesn't doesn't work well. <laughs> <laughs> you get, you get, you, yes, that's true. We're talking about primate inbreeding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the royal family, they had all kinds of yeah, diseases. Yeah, hemophilia yeah. was a biggie. That's right, right. right. You fix <laughs> all these recessive mutations, yeah. yes. So uh, these mammary cancers were identified and studied genetically, and when was it pinned down to a virus? Right, so that was pretty much Bittner. Okay. And uh, so I think the first official report was 1936, maybe, where he had discovered the milk agent. And that's when they realized that they could take the milk and you could actually inject the milk and get the mammary cancers from that. And that it was a filterable agent, and then, uh, then there were the studies with electron microscopy where they could actually visualize 
the fact that it was a virus. Yeah, so filterable agents are, are late 19th century, early 20th century. By, the, by 1936, we kind of had a pretty good idea what a virus was. And electron microscopy was invented in 1935. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that was a big breakthrough. So this is right, on, right in, the, uh, in the beginning of a, of a huge explosion in virology. Right. Cool. So by the 1930s, we already knew about Rouse Rouse's work, and that was known to be a virus, a tumor virus. Right. And was any connection made between mammary tumor viruses and Rouse? Um, no, I don't know that there was any connection made there. I mean, certainly because those were experiments in chickens. Right. And there was certainly inner uh, actions between scientists, I think, that were studying just viruses of mice. So there was the polyomavirus work. Right. In the 30s, we didn't even know what the genetic information was. Right. 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 So all you knew was you had a filterable agent that caused a disease. So you can, you're not going to make a distinction between a retrovirus and a polyomavirus. No, no. no. Right, no. right. You knew you had a filterable <laughs> agent. So it wasn't really until the electron microscopy studies that we knew could that at least there were different, different morphologically. Yeah. You know, even then, you know, retroviruses were the A type viruses, the B type virus, the C and D. I mean, they still, those terms still come up, even though they don't really tell you much about the biology of the virus. At what point was it found to be a retrovirus, this, this mouse mammary tumor inducing agent? Was it known to be a retrovirus? You know, I, that was probably more like Dan Moore's work in the 50s. Okay. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm not <clears throat> entirely clear when he first, you know, did, started to do, say, hybridization reactions, mm -hmm. things like that. Okay, so give, <clears throat> give us an overview of the life cycle of this virus. So this virus exists in wild mice in nature, we know that Absolutely. for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Every every mouse out there, or most mice, <clears throat> mouse species? Or not probably every the, mouse out there. So there are... You can find rare wild-caught mm -hmm. mice. So um, Mike and Harold actually did some studies on like Lake Casitas mice, and they could find ones that did not have endogenous MMTVs. So if you have an infection of germline you know, cells, then you actually fix it as an endogenous virus. And so most of the retroviruses that have been around very long with their species actually endogenize. So since, uh, you know, since we're doing this with such care for any new listeners out there, I just want to make sure that uh, they understand very basically what a retrovirus is. So the okay. genome is how many kilobases? So on the, on the order of 9 KB okay, RNA, my, yes, a single-stranded RNA deployed in my mind, uh, I always f I always equate, on average, a kilobase of DNA with a gene. So we're talking potentially about nine gene type size. So that's pretty small. It's not much genetic information. Right. There's an RNA molecule, two RNA, two copies of that in right. the virus. That's right. Plus reverse transcriptase goes into a cell. The reverse transcriptase ultimately makes a double-stranded DNA copy of that, right. which integrates into the genome. That's correct. Uh, so that's a, now a permanent record in that cell. It's integrated that's right. in the genome. And if that, that happens in a germline cell, then it becomes part of the vertical transmission of the gene. Right? That's what we call endogenization. And, and that integration step is obligatory as a part of the life cycle. It and is. And that's transcribed by the host uh, RNA polymerase, which makes both genomic and messenger RNA. You can make new virus get out. Well, in this case, the genomic RNA is a messenger RNA. Right. Okay. So, right. I just wanted to get all that down. Yes. Some of these. That was a great uh, summary. Some of these retroviruses kill cells. I don't know if MMTV does. Is it lytic? It is not lytic. Okay. There's so very few retroviruses HIV that is are lytic, lytic. right? Um, under certain circumstances. Well, I mean, it kills CD4 cells. It does. Right? The, so, it does. And it we will know, apoptose them. Yes. So. For most retroviruses that are not lytic, ha infecting a germ cell makes sense. It doesn't kill it, obviously. But then mm -hmm. there are some that are lytic, and the question would be, how does it inf how does it infect and endogenize the germ cell if it's killing it? It must be that the lytic potential is modulated in a germ cell in some way, right? Well, I mean, 
like I said, the most yeah. retroviruses that are out there are non-lytic. Right. So actually HIV is more an exception to the rule. Yeah, and, and of course we don't know of any human that's endogenized with HIV. Yet. No, and in fact until a few years ago there weren't no, any Lynchy viruses that were known to endogenize, and now there's some examples in the rabbit. There's a rabbit endogenous yeah. retrovirus that was recently discovered. There's some, there's some endogenous lentes in lemurs okay. also, which are, which are quite ancient, which allows us to date the origins at least you know, 20 million years ago right. or even more. It's quite interesting. So mice out there in the wild generally have endogenized MMTV? Exactly. So it strikes me potentially there's two ways to transmit this, right? Free virus could be transmitted from one animal to another, right. or um, an animal who has endogenous virus, that can be active, mm -hmm. right? And, and you can get virus out of that. Right. Okay. So there's also, if the virus is really recently endogenized, it will still be releasing infectious particles and can undergo both vertical and horizontal transmission. So the normal route of transmission is high production in the mother's milk and then the baby's nurse on that milk and in the first few weeks of life it goes unscathed into the small intestine where it infects dendritic cells and then B and T cells and as I have said a number of times is that virus has this temporal spatial problem because it needs to go back to the mammary gland in order to fulfill the milk borne transmission but in a newborn mouse it has no mammary gland so mammary gland doesn't develop until puberty so those lymphocytes really are its lifeline between the milk and the gut to the mammary gland its ultimate destination. So anything that interrupts that cycle of transmission, then it will interrupt the ability of the virus to be transmitted through the milk. I think of lymphocytes as, well, I guess there's all kinds, but I think of right. them as not necessarily very long lasting. Is this a particular type of lymphocyte that hangs around long enough to, for the mouse to make it to puberty? Right. So, um, yeah, these, there, you, you know, touch on sort of an interesting issue that I don't think has been studied very well, but it can be infecting some sort of memory okay. cell. And that would be a very long-lasting right. cell. We know that you can get lifelong immunity to viruses, so obviously they remember if they've seen that before. So they, they can last for decades, but, you know, in terms of the lifespan of the mouse, you know, the most important time is till puberty, which in the mouse is around four weeks. So acquired orally, acquired infects, orally. infects lymphocytes, hangs out, and then uh, where is it replicating in the mature mammary gland? Right. So I don't think that has been well studied either because... Uh, you know, one notion is it can infect primordial mammary cells, like mammary stem cells, mm -hmm. and that that can continuously reseed the population. That's one thing I'm very interested in doing, is seeing if we can develop MMTV-based vectors that could actually infect or be used to study even human mammary stem cells, because there's not very many promoters that actually work very well in the mammary gland. And in the undifferentiated mammary gland, MMTV is transcribed very, very poorly. It's under high negative regulation by transcription factors that bind to the LTR and the transcription regulatory units and shut it down. But during pregnancy and lactation, those transcription regulators are turned off and we've actually shown one of them is actually cleaved in late pregnancy, you release the negative regulation and then all the positive regulation of the glucocorticoid receptor mediated stimulation of transcription occurs. So this is an LTR. The LTR is a long terminal repeat, right, that has all the transcriptional signals in right. the provirus. Not that, all, but many. Yeah. So that thing is, uh, the message I'm getting is that that thing is tuned for... Uh, basically responding to the mammary gland development. And, it does. Okay. 
It's amazing. But it has to be tuned for the lymphocyte part of exactly. the cycle as well. I mean, that's to me is what's so amazing is now MMTV has a longer LTR or long terminal repeat. It has a lot to do. It has a lot to do because it has coding capacity. It actually is one of the few retroviruses that encodes the superantigen, and superantigen is required for this lymphocyte mediated trip to the mammary gland. And then it also has many of the cis-acting elements that control both post-transcriptional and transcriptional regulation. So you have those overlapping elements in this 1.3 kb. Is there any other species of animal that has a retrovirus that has uh, a sort of an overall biology, anything like this? Well, um, there is certainly at the nucleotide sequence level in us, we have what, what are known as human endogenous retrovirus type K. Okay. And that, you know, the, the, there's a number of these human endogenous retroviruses and they're thought to be something like eight to 9% of our total DNA is retroviral elements. Okay, HERV Ks, those, and, but so those Herv guys K's are dead, is right? More like as far as we know, although isolates have been either reconstituted or isolated from our germline that seem to have complete open reading frames for all of the known structural genes of the virus. So the GAG, the PAL, and the OMV, they have complete open reading frames. So it isn't clear whether maybe the reason that we can't get their replication to work is we haven't put them in the right cell type to study. But uh, to me, it also implies that perhaps sometimes dur sometime during our evolution, we had an MMTV-like thing going on and we got over it. Okay? That's right. And what you're seeing is the relic. That's right. We're seeing the relic. But today, we know that human breast cancer has nothing to do with an MMTV, right? Well, I, you know, I, I would never say never as a biologist. Um, but uh, there is, in my mind, no conclusive evidence that there has been a species jump from the mouse mammary tumor virus to humans to cause breast cancer. This is why scientists get in so much trouble. Yeah, this is true. You know, absolutely right. we We're won't like make attorneys. Any yeah, we won't make any absolute <laughs> statements, okay? But, <laughs> but that's will... the way it should be. If everybody did that, you know, it would be a more right. rational universe. Right. Um, so based on the data I have seen, I am not convinced. Okay. Um, but, and this is a big but, is that if we take a infectious clone of MMTV that will induce breast cancer in mice, or one that can induce a T-cell lymphoma, and we put it into human cells, and we overcome the receptor restriction, that those cells will release infectious virus. We can inject those cells into, the, into mice, and because the cells will be killed by the intact immune system of the mice, then those cells don't live anymore. But the virus is transmitted. Those animals will develop the particular disease that was characteristic of the clone that we put into the human cells. So that is a very kind of scary thought. And we, you know, we have published about using this particular strategy to infect mice. So theoretically from that, the barrier to, in, to, to crossing species there is just a receptor... Uh, Anti-receptor uh, interaction, right. right. So, and of course we have constant exposure to rodents. So if you do phylogeny with all the known MMTVs, all the retroviruses, can you, is there some, is there a common ancestor, say, to what's endogenized people and MMTVs, which would support the idea that maybe at one time in the past we acquired an MMT-like virus? I have never seen that kind of analysis. Um, you know, the, many of the HERV Ks that are in our genomes are highly, highly defective. And so um, there's been also many studies showing that there are parts of those that are still, the envelope genes are still being expressed. Um, there is a REV, uh, HIV REV-like gene that is made both by MMTV, which we showed, and then it has also been shown for the HERV-Ks. 
And those have, the Herf Ks have been said to manipulate and bind to certain kinds of transcription factors. So it's still possible to have big effects without making an infectious virus. So how does this thing cause cancer? Right. How does MMTV cause yes. cancer? So MMTV is not known to encode an oncogene. Really, retroviruses come in two flavors. One which causes, which has an oncogene, and if they infect the cell and they're able to express that oncogene, then the cell becomes transformed because you have a permanent integrated copy of that genome and the oncogene can be continuously expressed. And you can do this with just the oncogene alone and cause transformation. Then there are the viruses like MMTV that are not thought to encode an oncogene. And those seem to require high level replication in the target tissue. Then if they land near a particular oncogene and their promoter enhancer can activate or promote the transcription of this gene, then that altered regulation gives rise to the cancer. And are there preferred sites for integration of MMTV? Um, I think people have done some uh, examination of that, and it's certainly not completely random, but certainly every chromosome and many, many sites on those chromosomes are homes for uh, integrations. But of course, you're not going to, what you're going to see in cancer are the ones that are of That have already been selected. Yes. Right. And, and are there, uh, from that perspective, are there preferred uh, sites that result in cancer? Absolutely. I mean, that was another thing that Harold Varmus's lab did was to show that, um, that the Wnt genes uh, were a preferential target. So a growth factor gene, and then very shortly after um, then uh, Gordon Peters and Clive Dixon showed that the FGF genes were common integration sites, or what they called CISs, the common integration sites, that if you look at a mammary tumor, those are either clonal or semi-clonal uh, outgrowths of an original integration. So there are several classes of genes that have now been shown to be preferential integration sites for MMTV. And these are genes that basically have to do with regulation of cell growth of one sort or another. Right. Yeah, there are examples of uh, growth factors, some transcription factors, um, but it's the same sort of profile that you would see for the murine leukemia viruses. It's been qu done quite extensively. Okay. So. There, Rich asked something related before. I don't remember the answer, but in any other species out there that we know of, there's no mammary tumor causing virus, only in mice um, that we know of. Of that, course, that <laughs> yes, that we know of. Actually, uh, another beta retrovirus, the Mason Pfizer monkey virus, was originally isolated from a mammary tumor, but I don't believe that they showed that that was causative of the mammary cancer. Do you know whether uh, the mice in the wild get mammary cancer? Oh yes, this? they do. Okay. They do. So you can isolate mice with tumors? You can. So are these lethal, these, these tumors? Right. And I, I think the difference in, you know, if you catch a wild mouse, like my son picked up one in the garage and I'm like, what possessed you to do this? <laughs> 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 and, um, and of course, you very rarely see them in the wild with a mammary tumor because they would be at a great disadvantage. First of all, in order to get a mammary cancer, they usually have to, even in the laboratory, go through somewhere between four and six litters before you have enough integrations where you would happen to hit an oncogene like Wnt or FGF. In the wild, the lifespan of the mouse is very, very short. So probably they would not live to give four to six litters. So it's very unlikely to find a mouse in the wild that would have a breast cancer. What is, yes. the, what is the lifespan in the wild? I know lab mice one oh to two boy. years, right? Yeah, I bet that? it's six months or less. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so just because a mouse is infected with MMTV doesn't mean they're going to get a tumor that has to get integrated in the right place, right? So it's exactly. a pretty small percentage. It's a very small percentage of the integrations that will result in the outgrowth of a tumor cell. Right. And is it correct to say, like, 
many other transform viral induced transformations. Transformation is not required for the viral life cycle. That's correct. And I, I was sort of hesitating because transformation is not a term that you would really use for a virus that causes cancer like this. So for example, I could take MMTV and infect mammary epithelial cells in tissue culture, but we would never get transformation. Really? Yeah. It's fairly difficult to see that. I thought that was the first step, though, to become so a tumor, So that is, the, right? you know, transformation as we use it right. classically is this change in the shape, morphology, right. growth behavior of the cells. And that is typical of a virus that contains an oncogene, right. where you They'll would see that. this morphological change. It is because every virus has the oncogene, and you'll get a uh, hundred percent right. efficiency, basically. Right, and so it has to do with the scale the of guy, what you yeah. can do in vivo versus what you can do in cell culture. But in, in, you got in your culture with MMTV, maybe one cell is transformed. That's You're right. not going to see it. That's but if right. You could, but that transformation is not. It's not necessary for the virus to do that. That's it what, is not necessary right. for the virus so to we, do that. We made the blanket statement a while ago on TWIV that. Uh -huh. In general, viruses don't need to transform their right. host cells. And we got an email from someone who works on a fish retrovirus where the tumor is actually needed for the virus to spread from fish to fish. Okay. One so would this be Sandy Quackenbush? Or? Probably, yeah. And I, I had not known that. That was pretty cool. Right. So yeah, that's the fish and chips story, which is a really cool story. Fish and too. chips. <laughs> wow. Because the tumors fall off <laughs> yes. in the spring. Right. Yeah, and so you get the chips. Yes. So uh, uh, I'm just curious if you. So you can grow this virus in culture. In Absolutely. The lab. Mm -hmm. So we can't if, do plaque assays. Though. We cannot do plaque assays. <laughs> so what ha if you have a dish of cells? What sort of cells would you ordinarily use? Well, we we use actually a number of different cell types. I mean, you could grow it in B cells. You can grow it in T cells. These you can grow it in rat cells, fibroblasts. Yeah. Okay. So if you have like a fibroblast cell line that's adherent, forms a monolayer in a dish, right. and you infect it uh, with this virus, do you see a cytopathic effect? No. And you see no morphological effect either. But the media then is going to fill up with a slug of virus, right? I mean, um, it'll infect and the virus buds out of the cells and you get virus in the media, right? Sometimes. <laughs> um, this is a virus that does not cause viremia in the animal. So the virus is very cell associated. And so it's really thought that what you need is cell to cell crosstalk and that the virus will probably be transferred across the virological synapse. So that also helps it hide from the immune system and is one of the many tools that MMTV and viruses like it use to mask themselves from the immune system. Uh, so I think, so when you culture, I think I now vaguely remember you telling me this, when you culture virus and you want to infect an animal, you infect them with infected cells. Is That's that, right. Uh, that was one of the reasons that, 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 we, okay. that we transfect an infectious clone into, say, a human jerkat T cell. Okay. And then we can inoculate that into mice and they release the infectious okay. virus and the cells die. You know, we don't know how long they live, but probably less than a week. Jeez, no plaque assay. What a bummer. <laughs> what, we um, have our ways. Do we, do you, is it known what the receptor is? That yes, the transferrin receptor. Tran of course. Yeah, what am I talking right, about? We did that. <laughs> this on right. Well, okay. I will, uh, you go ahead. I will look up what episode that was. Yeah, that's right. And, and so I wanted to ask you whether that work done uh, by... Um, Sarah Sawyer's lab, was it a collaboration? And, I don't remember. Well, it was really identified by Susan Ross. No, the receptor, the but the, the paper of uh, Sarah's recently showing the, the uh, pressure the virus puts on the receptor. That's right. That's right, because there's also, you know, arena viruses that use it, right. but a different site on this. So it's a very popular molecule to be hijacked by viruses. I, I guess my question is, did they work on MMTV because you're down the hall, or was that an independent... Um, you know, she certainly got some reagents from us, and we've actually tried a few experiments together, actually, to see if we could 
get the uh, infection of, say, dog cells, but those experiments didn't work because that's, I think, there's another restriction in dog cells that's not just entry related. Okay. Yeah, once again, for the listeners, Sarah Sawyer, whose twiv that I'm trying to look up is what, right down the hall? Right. Here, right? That's right. Uh, upstairs or on this floor? No, she's, she's in the next building, building. but on the okay. same floor that we're connected by this uh, corridor. So can you give us a f sense for what topics you're interested these days with MMTV, whatever you can talk about, Okay. recent things? Um, so one of, I think, our big contribution to the field, other than learning about what causes tissue specificity of the virus, because there are viruses that are related to MMTV that cause T-cell leukemia is not breast cancer, and we've mapped that specificity really to the long terminal repeats and how high the transcription occurs in different cell types. But we uh, relatively recently showed that MMTV is organized more like the complex retroviruses such as HIV and HTLV because it has both accessory and regulatory genes. And it was thought that all mouse retroviruses were so-called simple retroviruses that they only encoded the genes that go to make a virus particle. But we show that, that MMTV actually has a doubly spliced messenger RNA that encodes this HIV REV-like gene called, we called it REM. And uh, other members of the beta retroviruses like HERV-K have a similar kind of protein called REC. And uh, we're really excited about this particular gene because it has some very different biology than the REV gene. So it does part of the job that REV does, but it is about three times as long as REV. And so it has a very complicated trafficking scheme inside the cell. And I guess we first, uh, when we first identified the gene, we were tagging it. And I guess this is a warning to all molecular biologists is be careful about adding a tag. So it saved us time in that we could follow the protein before we had antibody against it. Um, but it killed a lot of the activity. And one of the activities that it absolutely has to do is the virus or this particular gene, REM, has a very long signal peptide whose job is to normally to take it to the endoplasmic reticulum for being either exported from the cell or becoming an integral membrane protein. In this case, it, the REM gene uses its signal peptide to go into the endoplasmic reticulum and then the C terminus is cleaved off by signal peptidase. And then the N-terminus is the REV-like equivalent, the signal peptide, which is 98 amino acids. And then that protein is extracted from the endoplasmic reticulum by using the process, the normal protein um, um, surveillance machinery to see that proteins are properly folded and assembled, and if they aren't, then they are put into the proteasome and triaged. So the virus is actually using that process of e extraction from the ER membrane. It's called retrotranslocation or dislocation. And then it comes back out into the cytosol. Its uh, NLS is bound by an important. Then it goes into the nucleus, binds the viral RNA, and then chaperones it back out through its NES sequence and by linking to the CRIM1 export pathway. So I once entitled a, a seminar uh, as like a Beach Boys song around, you know, round, round, get around, I get around, <laughs> because this protein really gets around. And that's not even, we haven't followed yet the trafficking of the C terminus, which seems to be doing something very unusual as well. So we would predict that that's going to be a secreted protein, but it looks like it might be trafficking to the Golgi and then going somewhere else. So can, uh, can you make a virus that lacks this, that lacks REM? 
So you can make a virus that lacks the REMC terminus, okay. but you cannot make a virus that lacks the signal peptide because it needs that signal peptide for its REV-like function, and it also needs it to direct envelope to the ER to make it an integral membrane protein and to bind the receptor. Okay. So this, this, the so the only thing it could potentially do without, and we have made a mutant that cannot make the REM gene product. It can actually make the signal peptide from both the OM singly splice message or from the REM doubly splice message. So you can knock out the ability of REM to be synthesized, and it can't make the C-terminus, but it can make signal peptide from OMV, and in tissue culture, we cannot tell the difference. So right now, we have it in mice, and we're analyzing, we're assuming that this function is something to do with its very complex lifestyle in the mouse, because it really gets around in the mouse, too. So a rev of HIV is needed to export unspliced or partially spliced mRNAs, right? That's correct. Because normally the export machinery recognizes sp spliced mRNAs for export, right? Because mm -hmm. they're, they're marked with SNRP, certain proteins in the SNRPs that mark them for export. That's right. And then the REV binds the RNA and marks it. So, uh, sorry, REV of HIV. So your protein, MMTV, REM. This, the, yes, so the N-terminus of N-terminus that gets REM. pulled out, it goes into the ER, gets pulled out. Right, and then goes to the nucleus and, and then, then gets get the, the RNA, RNA and then traffics back and forth between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. So this story is striking because you've worked on this virus for decades and there's still stuff to be found. Yeah, we're just now finding new gene products. It's amazing. You know, so just, yeah. you know, so we just reported that there, this uh, was an absolutely required uh, cleavage event, and that was in uh, 2010. You have a you have a, a genome yes. <coughs> map here. <coughs> yes, here we do. So ah, uh, so REM. Right. So here's the REM gene product. So here's the doubly splice message, and then here's the envelope singly splice message. So it turns out that the signal peptide and then the first part of the surface portion of the envelope are, you know, in this particular exon. And then you have the second splicing event and then part of the transmembrane portion of the envelope is fused in frame. So it's the same open reading frame for the REV-like gene product and the envelope gene product. So this is how uh, highly efficient and is so indicative so of got, what viruses can do. So you get the same, actually the same amino acid Same sequence, amino acid Doing sequence, something like totally different. Doing something totally different. Even trafficked, because envelope isn't trafficked like this, this crazy trafficking, right? Well, I mean, envelope is certainly does something more like a classical transmembrane Classical glycoprotein, right? right. Because it has to have the signal peptide directed to the ER. Um, the signal peptide is cleaved off, but there is this anchor sequence um, that holds it in the membrane, and then it goes, you know, from the ER to the Golgi and then to the cell surface. But this thing gets pulled out. At that's right, point. at least the signal peptide. And the, that's the other unusual thing, because most signal peptides, which are usually 15 to 30 amino acids, they are usually degraded by an enzyme resident in the ER membrane called signal peptide peptidase, SPP. So there's a signal peptidase that cleaves off the signal peptide, and then there's the, the degradation of the signal peptide. But in the case of this virus and some other viruses, there are long signal peptides that have additional functions. And there's also, in, you know, instances like that in the cell. So and the, actually, the software programs don't even recognize it as a signal peptide. Does REM have the whole N-terminus of ENV? Is it start the same and the, all the way down to where that second splice happens? That's correct. So, so most of it is the very, you know, the signal peptide plus the N-terminus of the SU portion of envelope. 
and then the C-terminal portion of the transmembrane protein that is part of the envelope. So, I mean, it strikes me you've got a big problem here to figure out what parts of the sequence. So here's a diagram of, you know, what the RIM gene product, which is 301 amino acids. So the N-terminus is this REV-like portion, is 98 amino acids. It has a nuclear and nuclear localization signal, an RNA binding domain, and this leucine-rich NES. So it, it looks like REV, but it goes to the ER first. And it has to go to the ER to get access to signal peptidase. What, what I'm puzzling about is okay. that all the same sequences are in ENV, and yet their pathways bifurcate at some point. Do you have any idea how that's done? What right, because you're cleaving off signal, the signal peptide. Okay. The signal peptide's going to go its own way, and I that's see. true for most genes that traffic through the classical pathway. And then, you know, envelope will be tethered in the membrane, whereas the cleavage product of REM would not be tethered in the membrane. So presumably that's one of the things that makes it traffic differently than the REM C terminus. And the well, NLS would never be in the cytoplasm, right? Would be well, the NLS is actually in the cytoplasm, but we, it's, we think. It's part of the signal sequence, right? It is. So the signal, the actual tether, is at the C-terminus of the signal peptide. So that's what's anchoring it in the membrane. So if you look at the region that spans the membrane, it's like 15 to 20 amino acids and is usually an alpha helix. And the NLS would... But the NLS is actually hanging out into the cytosol and could bind an important right there, but it wouldn't be able to, right. you know, it's target it to the nucleus right. until it's out of the membrane. So as, as part of envelope, the same signal sequence is part of envelope. But That's that, right. The envelope goes into the ER, and then the, the signal sequence is degraded by the peptidase you mentioned. The yeah, well, it's, no, I mean, the, the signal peptide doesn't get degraded. We don't know why it doesn't get degraded. In this degraded. case, it doesn't, but normally. It doesn't. Normally, it would be by the signal peptide peptidase. Uh, so the, so the, uh, the envelope signal sequence is used for another purpose here. That's right. Okay, I got it. So it's dual <laughs> use. So in the envelope... Dual use. Dual use, uh-oh. Uh, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> the NSA, what? the NSA the NSA is going to gonna be after you. Oh, okay. Dual. But this is dual use research, but it's not of concern. It's not of any concern. <laughs> it's of great interest, though. Actually, it's not dual use research. It's just dual use. The dual use of the peptide. By the virus. Well, yeah. what I find so fascinating about the virus and why I keep coming back to it is the fact that it gives, has given us so many insights into cell biology, into immunology, and to cancer biology. All of those things. I mean, if you list, look at the list of Nobel laureates and members of the National Academy who have worked on this virus. So the discovery of, say, glucocorticoid, uh, like hormone regulate, regulation of transcription, that came from studying the MMTV LTR because it has you know, uh, glucocorticoid response element and the glucocorticoid receptor. So a lot of the biology of hormone regulation has come from studying MMTV. And yet, as you, you described to me yesterday, right now at least, there aren't many labs that are working on it. That's right, because the overwhelming majority of the funding goes to studying HIV and the human viruses. Because it causes a disease, right? right? This which is isn't, basic science. Which isn't bad to That's work not on, bad. but to the exclusion of basic science is bad. That's because right. you're going to miss a lot of stuff like we've just heard today. Well, and then the other thing is this is very HIV-like. I mean, if, if we hadn't kept studying it and looked at the fact that now it does have the, all these accessory and regulatory genes, it wouldn't be appreciated that this is a model for HIV and it's a much more highly manipulable model than what you can do for HIV. Not too many volunteers for those experiments. So yesterday you were telling me, this is another area that really interests me, you were telling me about the problems of the mouse model because all the mice do have endogenous virus and making a mouse that does not. Oh, right. right, right. That's a good story. Tell us right. that. Yes. Yeah. So this is the other grant that we have right now is to try to understand what is the contribution 
of endogenous viruses to the immune system of the mouse. So I was telling you that we make a, a number of recombinant you know, viruses are using recombinant DNA technology to answer basic questions about how the virus replicates or causes cancer. And we found if we inject those recombinants into mice, they recombine with the endogenous retroviruses. So even those are not making infectious particles themselves, they can get packaged into the particle since it's a diploid genome and then the reverse transcriptase can make new recombinants that fix those mutations. And so often the interpretation of those experiments is very difficult for us. So I went, aha, is that we can breed those out because there are rare inbred strains that do not have endogenous MTVs. So we went through a very classical mouse genetics and we were sort of doing this in the background of other sorts of experiments. And then my lab manager came back and she said, well, I've back crossed these mice now six generations and then I infected them by the milkborne root with MMTV. And she said, none of them are getting breast cancer. So now you have a, you have a matched pair of mice that That's are genetically right. essentially identical except that one has the MMTV provirus in how many copies? Right, so we normally use a strain called BALB-C or BAG albino. Okay. So these are white mice and so these particular mice have three copies of MMTV okay. and one on chromosome 6, one on chromosome 12, and one on chromosome 16. Okay, and you have a matched mouse that otherwise is genetically identical, but right. doesn't have those proviruses. That's right. And what's the result here? You infect those? And you infect the ones without the endogenous MTVs, and now the exogenous virus infection is blocked. And it's blocked at a very early stage. In so we intestine. think- So you, what do you, inf you infect pups or adult mice? So we can do either. And we showed it was independent of the route of inoculation. So we did that with uh, by intraperitoneal injection, you know, bypassing the gut altogether. We did it by foster nursing on mice that we knew were excreting a large amount of, of uh, MMTV. And in either case, the mammary cancer incidence was dropped to almost nothing, essentially to the spontaneous tumor rate of the strain. Do you know what the block to infection is? So we know that it's very early. So we cannot see superantigen mediated deletion of target T cells. That's one of the first indicators that there's been amplification in the lymphoid population. So we think it might be very early, like in infection of the dendritic cells, because the cells can be infected, but the transcription is very, very poor in dendritic cells. So there's really not very much virus replication if they only get to the dendritic cells and never infect T cells and you don't get the superantigen response. Do you, do you think that the endogenous virus is providing something that allows the virus to replicate or is it? Well, I, all we know is that some of these endogenous viruses are greatly defective. For example, one of them is like two LTRs that essentially all of the guts of the structural genes have been deleted. So you have two kind of tandem LTRs. So the only thing that this particular provirus has is superantigen. And we could provide that, we could inbreed back that particular provirus. And if they were only making that superantigen, then we could partially restore the defect. So wait a minute, you're telling me now that you can make other derivative strains that have one, one yeah. oh. yes, one copy. Jeez. Just super antigen, right? That's the power of mouse so genetics. We, we <laughs> haven't really talked about super antigen. This is another protein that is made from the virus. Yeah, so this would be an accessory gene. Again, if you delete super antigen in s tissue culture, you can n tell no difference in the replication of the virus. This is just a gene that is needed for this virus in the mouse okay. to deal with the immune system and this great, the great hitchhike that it has to do from the gut to the mammary gland. So this is a protein that's expressed on the 
I, I have to review this all the time because I'm my immunology is just yeah. It's awful. on antigen presenting cells. Uh, it's so on antigen presenting cells. So like what, B and, cells and dendritic cells. And what does it do? And so it is put on the surface with the molecule MHC class two, which you know is a dimer, and its job is ordinarily to present a peptide that it has gotten, you know, in the from loading in the endosomes, puts it on the surface. And then the T cells are always going around looking for a peptide that's not supposed to be there. And then the T cell receptor will bind to that particular complex and respond either by div division or by release of cytokines to alert the immune system there's an invader. Okay, and the super antigen, the super antigen a bunch of T cells. That's right. So the super antigen hitchhikes to the surface with MHC class 2 with any kind of peptide, it doesn't care. And then it is able to bind to large numbers of T cells because it only recognizes primarily the variable region of the beta chain of the T cell receptor. So what that means is it's not as picky as a peptide antigen would be. And so it can react with up to 30% of all T cells, whereas a given peptide you know, in a naive mouse would usually react with one in 10,000 T cell receptors, one in 10,000 T cells. So this is a, a way in which the virus is sort of hijacked, again, the, uh, the immune function of the mouse. So it's using the immune response to get amplification of lymphocytes, whereas ordinarily you'd be trying to amplify an antiviral response. In this case, you're amplifying the virus replication. Okay, so you're amplifying the, the, the cells that the target with the cells that the virus wants to replicate on. That's right. Well, not only that, but now the sort of immune cell profile in that mouse is going to be very different, right, than a mouse that's not expressing super antigen. Right. So when they have these endogenous viruses, that's true. So if super antigen is presented in primarily in the thymus during education of what is self and non-self, then all T cells that are reactive with those endogenous superantigens will get deleted. So, or they will be energized. That is, they will be non-reactive. And so the repertoire of mice, the T cell repertoire of mice that have superantigen is quite different than those that don't have superantigen. Okay, so even though those mice are genetically identical, the compartment in the mice where the, that the virus cares about is actually going to be quite different. It's right. That's right. But that isn't the only solution here. Because <laughs> you said so it, didn't, it didn't replicate. It doesn't well. replicate. Yeah. yeah. And so... In BALB-C mice, which have already three copies, you know, and they've deleted certain T cell subsets in those mice, mm -hmm. you know, they, that's what they seem to need to have those endogenous viruses there to clear the way for something. We would really like to know what the something is, and that's one of the reasons that we have a longstanding collaboration with Ethan Shabak at NIH. Um, and he's been interested also in, in studying chronic infections uh, by an arena virus, LCMV. So this is a great this is a great example of you make this mice to you make these mice to solve some problem, the recombination, so that you can do these experiments, right. and a whole nother problem comes out of that. Right, right. Rich, if you if, if you present a super antigen in MHC class two. What type of T cell is it going to be recognized by? CD4. Exactly. <laughs> I know. See, you do know them, you know. No, <laughs> we, we came up with this way of doing this. I get it now. Right? Gosh. So, so class one around. is recognized by uh, CD8. CD8. Because so one times right. eight is eight. The product is always eight. And <laughs> CD4 is, is recognizing MHC2 because four times two is eight. The product is always eight. That was a tough um, one. I'm glad okay. I'm, I'm not understanding. <laughs> I'm not understanding this deletion of T cells, is that because the virus is replicating in them, but it's not no, lytic? No, so this is an is immune that? reaction. You so know, when so you what you need to delete anything that's self-reactive, right? right. right. Or you'll lead to autoimmune this disease. Is, this is during the maturation of the immune system. This is during the, the maturation. Mouse. You're teaching the mouse. If it's in being presented in the thymus, then it must be self, and therefore you don't react against it. 
And so those T cells that are reactive are deleted from the immune repertoire. So they are, they are apoptose. And self includes super antigen. Yeah. So, so in this particular case, when you're an endogenous virus, okay, because the they super know antigen. no difference whether you're a so coat color gene. Got or, it. And since and since that's the uh, super antigen is so broadly reactive against a class of T cells, you're deleting thirty percent of your T cell repertoire, right? Up to that. I mean, you know, like the the kinds that are that the bowel particular viruses, it's not 30% of the repertoire. So it depends on, you have many different classes of T cells, but it can be up to 30%. And that's why it's a super antigen, not a regular but antigen. But in, in, a, in a, a newborn mouse or an adult, uh, the super antigen will still, or, or this is wrong, in, in a newborn mouse, the super antigen does not lead to proliferation of T cells? Because if they've all been energized, killed in the thymus, there's none right, so right. that it was an experiment that we did with Susan Ross's lab um, quite some time ago when superantigen was first discovered. So if we make transgenic mice that have the same superantigen specificity as, say, a milkborne virus, then if that is in being expressed in the thymus, those T cells are deleted, and that particular exogenous virus can no longer infect through the milk because the T cell reactive, the SAG reactive T cells are, are now deleted. They're gone. Okay, so that the, the so, virus needs those to grow so in. So okay. the endogenous viruses of Balb C, which is highly susceptible to the C3H virus, they delete superantigens of a different specificity. So the superantigen has a slightly different function in this virus than, say, the TSS toxic shock syndrome superantigen of Staph aureus, which right. causes a massive amplification of T cells in you when you're infected with the bacteria, and that's that's what causes the pathology, right? Right. Here, it's more of a stealth mechanism to provide the virus with what it needs to replicate and move around, right? Is that a fair? Yes. Summary? So, okay. superantigen is needed for this lymphocyte-mediated amplification and trafficking to the mam mammary gland. It is a transmission phenomenon, and that's why you don't really have to worry about it in tissue cool. culture. Wow. Uh, now I know a, little, a lot more about MMT. So, 9KB <laughs> and how many yeah, cell types? that it has to master. It has mastered the immune system. It is a lifelong infection. Uh, it is really incredible feat how many different systems it has mastered in order to really cause this lifelong infection. Stupid little piece of RNA, you know? And you were amazing. <laughs> and you work with viruses with huge hundreds of kilobase genomes. They didn't do anything near this. No. It's just crazy. Yeah. And of course, well, they the, do a fair number of things to fool the immune system. The yeah. pox viruses yeah. do. But it they, can be done. Some much, of those are really cool could. things that pox viruses do it's also. It's amazing how much more elegant you can be. Pox viruses. Are you are, calling my virus yeah. inelegant? It's pox viruses. Just are, not as efficient. It are is sledgehammers. Kind of, yeah, They're sledgehammers. Kind of you're right. You're right. I've often, said, I've often said that if you're a cell, I can't imagine a worse disaster than being infected by a pox virus. Just like, oh no! You said yesterday the pox viruses come in and slam the cell, and that's it. There's no it's subtlety, true. right? That's why I like it. <laughs> All right, that was great. Uh, wait a minute. Anything else, Rich? Uh, yes. So, uh, the uh, episode where we actually discussed in detail Sarasoya's trans uh, transferrin receptor. Because that was um, at the ASV meeting. Uh, huh? No. Well, we have two episodes here. One is TWIV 242, I Want My MMTV. Uh -huh. That's where we discussed the paper. The paper yeah. And uh, TWIV 193, live at Madison, is where we had Sarah on the show. Yeah, I think she didn't talk about <clears throat> the transferrin at that time. Uh, maybe a little bit. Certainly not in the same kind of detail as we did in uh, 242. It wasn't published. And that was, uh, so we've, and then there was one other MMTV episode where we talked about the uh, effect of the gut microbiome in yes. my son. That's uh, right. Uh, that's uh, Tanya Golevkin as well. Golevkin at, at University of Chicago, right? Right. Yeah. I will look that So now we have too. four MMTV episodes. Not bad, out of 255, right. right? So again, you know, ways in which <laughs> it's a basic virus can teach you about the biology of right. how do the you organism. Spell, how do you spell G-O-L-O-V-K-I-N-A. Tatiana. 
Has it been hard to work on this virus continuously in terms of support? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think it, there is, you have to have something rather earth-shaking, I believe, to keep studying a virus like this. I guess, fortunately, it keeps providing me new, you know, windows into the soul of the cell. And I've, you know, like managed that. to maintain funding on it. And you plan to do this the rest of your career, stay with MMTV, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly am very interested in almost any yeah. retrovirus. And I'm also very interested in breast cancer. And so I'm, I'm still quite intrigued by the idea of understanding breast cancer and breast cancer stem cells by developing vectors that can target them. Right. You must be very persistent because many other investigators... Like the viruses that exactly, I studied. Exactly, that was a little play. <laughs> <laughs> because many other investigators would have switched to HIV. And right. they say, oh, it's too hard to get funding for my virus. But you didn't. So right. you must really believe in MMTV. I do. I believe that it still has things to teach us. TWIV 154, symbiotic safe crackers. Yeah. Okay. Symbiotic safe crackers. Uh, that's uh, the one where we discussed the, the contribution of gut microbiota to uh, yep. infections, including Tanya's paper on MMTV. Right. So safe crackers is what Dixon de Pommier calls viruses. They're all safe crackers. Oh, okay. Well. You know, they figure out a way to get in the cell and steal they things, are, right? They are. They're so like you, Trojan horses. Uh, you yeah, just too. expressed something that I feel strongly about, which is that uh, the, the viruses are our teachers, okay? To go in with preconceptions about how this might work, mm -hmm. I mean, it's one approach, but to me, it's, it's kind of better just to, this is the discovery approach, just to explore and let the virus genes, you know, you knock out a gene and see what happens. Um, the viruses are a lot smarter than me. They got a, a, a much better imagination and to take a genetic Well, we wouldn't have to, to do an experiment if we could predict everything, right? I mean, it wouldn't be nearly so much fun. If we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research. That's you right. You have a quote on your wall there by Albert Einstein. I love that quote. Right. Um, that was a gift from my lab manager, and I probably had to do with after she'd done the 10 back crosses and couldn't get any breast cancers out of the MMTV infection. <laughs> I think this is an important point about science that maybe a lot of non-scientists don't appreciate that. You have to just explore often right. to find things. You don't and you often have, go down a blind alley, yeah. and then you have to backtrack or redirect. We don't, know if we don't often have a plan. Right? We, mm -hmm. we well, you don't tell some, the study section No, that. you can't tell them that. You have to tell them you have a plan, which I always found disingenuous, that what you really do is, is often different from what you propose because right. there's, there's a certain way you have to propose things. But I think the public needs to understand that you need to just get good scientists, give them a place to work, resources, and let them alone. But there's this new, there's this new uh, atmosphere here in the U.S. at least that we can't let scientists alone anymore. They have to be... Uh, monitored. There's got to be a product out the other end. There has to be a product. Okay. We have to monitor them. They're, they're, they're not, not you know. trustworthy. Yes, and I just don't know where that... Well, I have some ideas where it's come from, and uh, it's really unfortunate. Well, I, it mainly comes from ignorance. I think that's what people fear, is that, what they don't know. That's why it's important for us to communicate. It is stuff, This, so that, this so type of a understand. show is absolutely necessary. I think we have not done enough of this to educate the general public. Uh, so other than, you know, I've probably taught over 2,000 students now, you know, not including graduate students, but, um, you know, they are really um, the ones that need to spread the word. Sure. And that's a very small subset of the whole population. So I think if you actually can talk to someone one-on-one, -on -one, it's easy to gain their interest about. They've all had viral infections. Many of them either have had or know somebody who has cancer. So it's easy to relate to somebody about disease. And so we just do not convey our enthusiasm or even try to come down to some sort of level that they can appreciate. And it, it doesn't have to be a very sophisticated view. I think, to get most people engaged. Most people do want to know. I, yeah, we've discussed recently, you know, the, the 
stories that come out in the popular press about like Pandora virus and stuff. People are interested in this uh -huh. stuff. Okay, you just have to let them know. You know? It's interesting. You say you've <coughs> taught two thousand students and fellows over the years. Well, now this episode will reach over ten thousand. Right. Yes, one I'm episode. very excited about <laughs> so that. So that is the power of, <laughs> of podcasting in right. general and TWIV, and that's why I think uh, it, it's why we do it in part because we can reach so many people and try and make a difference. I do it because it's a gas. It is. It's just it's really, really fun, fun, and that's that's the best one of the best Actually, things it about. Nice. It is nice to reach all the people. This episode of TWIV will be on iTunes and TWIV.TV as usual. And if you like what we do, a way that you can help us for now anyway, we may ask for some money in the future, is to go over to iTunes and leave a comment or you can leave a star rating. And the way the iTunes directory works, that helps to keep us on the front page of the Science Podcast directory. And that way more people can discover what this neat world of viruses is all about, as you've heard. If you have questions and comments, send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Jackie Dudley is at the University of Texas, Austin. Thank you so much for speaking with us well, today. Thank you for having me. It's been a delight. Great. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. My pleasure. This is uh, great fun. And thank you again, Jackie, from me. Good to see you. Two days. Two in days a row. in a row. This is a gas. Could do it. Could why you do we it just, every day? Sure. Why don't we just quit and do nothing but this? <laughs> you know, I was thinking as we were talking. Yeah, I would we like were just <clears throat> just every day going to another virologist. I wouldn't yeah. mind traveling and, and doing this. And I, yeah. I think. Well, you kind of do when you go to a meeting, right? Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. what I like. I like being able to interact with this most of those people that I really enjoy. I know things about their families. And plus, we immediately have a connection for what we do. You know, there's just this subset of people that Someday. have the same enthusiasm. Someday. Someday we can do that. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>